With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. The story is told of a Presbyterian who was so focused on the biblical doctrine of predestination, he thought that every single event of his life was meticulously preordained and predestined by God, so much so that one day when he slipped at the top of the stairs, he fell all the way down and busted his head open, and with a big old gash in his noggin, he got up to his feet, and he said, well, thank God that's finally over. That man was so convinced that everything had been predestined by God, that even as painful and unwelcome as it was, he was able to thank God for it. How about you? Have you reached a place in your life that you can thank the Lord for everything He sends, causes, or at the very least allows into your life, even if it's difficult and painful? Several years ago, I was preaching on how the Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. I mentioned in that sermon that the blessing of children is the only blessing I knew of that God's people go out of their way to try to not receive. I'm not trying to be off color, but we spend millions of dollars a year trying to avoid the blessing of children. But yet I find in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, another blessing that if we're gut level honest, it's a blessing we'd rather not have. Because to get this blessing, you have to be persecuted. To get this blessing, you have to be reviled, hated, mistreated, slandered, blasphemed. Men have to say all manner of evil against you falsely. To get this blessing, you have to end up being treated the way that all the prophets of old were treated. Men who were martyred, slain wrongly incarcerated, throats slit, sewn in two. And if that's the prerequisite to this blessing, can we be transparent with each other? That's a blessing I'd rather not have. Lord, if you can bless me by being poor in spirit, I'll take some of that. God, if you can bless me by mourning, I'll take some of that. If you can bless me by hungering and thirsting for righteousness, I'll take some of that. And Lord, I'll take some of that. Blessed are the man whose transgressions have been forgiven. (laughs) But then when I come to this blessing, I want to say, Lord, you've blessed me so abundantly and overwhelmingly. I'm so full of your blessing. I can't take another blessing, especially that kind that requires being persecuted. And yet Jesus tells us very plainly, Blessed are they who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This blessing that most of us don't really want is the blessing of persecution. Now, we need to define what we're talking about this morning because every hardship is not persecution. Every difficulty you face is not being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Webster's Dictionary defines persecution as hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious belief. And again, if we're honest, that's a blessing we'd rather not have. There are three simple truths that I want to set before you this morning. I preached from this text back in the summer of 2021. We, uh, we, we had a student camp that year that talked about being willing to be unpopular for the sake of Christ. And much of what I'm going to share this morning, I shared in that message, but that ought not surprise you because the truth hasn't changed in 2,000 years, let alone in three years. It's the blessing that comes from being persecuted. Note with me, first of all, the reasons for persecution. What is it that precipitates persecution in our lives? Jesus says in verse 10, persecution comes for righteousness' sake. Down in verse 11, he mirrors that idea and says persecution comes for my sake, that is for Christ's sake. I want to point out that Jesus says in verse 11, blessed are ye when, not if, but when men shall revile 
you. In the mind of our Lord, who we have to acknowledge is an expert on everything, including persecution, Jesus preached that persecution was not a matter of if for the child of God. It was only a question and a matter of when. Well, when does persecution occur? I think I find three issues right here in this text. First, persecution comes because of the witness from our life. The life that we live is a cause of persecution. Jesus described it in verse 10 as for righteousness' sake. When we enter into the kingdom being poor in spirit, when we mourn over our sin and receive the comfort that comes from confession, When we walk before God in meekness, that is, a life that is controlled by power from heaven's throne. When we hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. When we lavish extravagant mercy on fellow fallen sinners. When we seek to live pure in heart and live at peace with God and our fellow man. Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He said that doesn't mean it's going to be a bed of roses living in the kingdom of God. He warns us in advance that persecution, slander, and reviling is going to come, and it's going to come for righteousness' sake. Could I say it in simple South Georgia language? When you live for God, your right behavior is a source of conviction and indignation for an unrighteous world. This past weekend, I did some work on a wooden fence around our backyard, and one of the things I needed to do was was set that fence post. It was actually a gate post. I needed to get it absolutely level and plumb so that when the gate would swing against it, I would get the clearance that I needed. It looked right to the naked eye. But you builders and handy men know that the bubble in the middle of that level doesn't lie. And I fought with that thing and fought with that thing. I thought about rather than fixing the post, I'm going to get me a Sharpie and redraw the lines on this level bubble. The lost people that you work with, live with, go to school with, they may think their life is acceptable to the naked eye. But when the righteous behavior of a Jesus follower gets laid up next to them, all of a sudden the bubble doesn't lie. And the righteous life as a standard can be a cause and source of persecution. You see, friend, this world is not opposed to religion. It's not opposed to good deeds. It's not even angry that you're at church this morning. But when you start mentioning the authority of the Word of God, when you start praising the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you start saying there's only one way that a sinner can be saved, when you mention that our faith must be in a once dead, now resurrected Galilean carpenter from Nazareth, I tell you this world will turn on you like a rabid dog. And the fact that many of us cannot relate to even the mildest form of persecution is an indictment in and of itself. For the Holy Spirit through Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not some, not many, not most, but all. Not can, not might not probably will, but will suffer persecution. John MacArthur comments here that if we never experience ridicule, criticism, or rejection because of our faith, we have reason to question the genuineness of that faith. Now, I need to make a distinction at the outset of the message. Persecution is when you face difficulty for doing right. Punishment is when you face difficulty for doing wrong. Persecution is when you face difficulty for doing right. Punishment is when you face difficulty for doing wrong. So kids, when your mama tells you to take out the trash or clean your room and you don't, and she takes your phone away, that is not persecution for righteousness' sake. That's called good parenting. 
When your boss fires you for stealing money and office supplies from the company, that's not being persecuted. That's called the consequences of doing wrong. But when you are acting for righteousness' sake and you suffer for it, that's called persecution. And Jesus said it leads to blessing in the life of a believer. Peter, who wrote much about persecution to the early church, says in 1 Peter 4, Make sure none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. That is, when you get your term paper, as one college student in our church recently had happen, when you get a term paper returned to you, And because of the righteous content of it, your liberal professor didn't like it. The Bible says he may not like it, but God does. And you should rejoice. The word persecution that appears here in this text is a Greek word that literally means to make, to run, to harass, to trouble, or to pursue in a hostile manner. You see, friend, the world is watching you. And they will chase you, run after you pursue you, and watch you like a good bird dog. What are they watching for? Watch this now. The world is watching you in hopes that you will fail. When you hit your thumb with a hammer at work, the world is not hoping you will hold your tongue. They're hoping you'll let out a string of four-letter words that will make a drunk sailor blush. You know why? Because that will justify them talking that way. And in a strange way that the depraved mind works, it will justify every other sin in their life. Don't tell me about the standards of the Bible. I heard what you said when that happened. I want you to notice this statement on the screen, and you better write it upon your heart. When you stumble, the world will be glad. When you stand, the world will be mad. When Nebuchadnezzar told the millions of Babylonian captives to bow before the idol, none of those Jews who dropped to their knees got the anger of the Babylonian king. It was the three who stood and kept on standing. And when you stand for that which is right and you evidence it from your life, persecution will often be the result. Philippians 2.15 declares, Prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Now, of course, Jesus said in John's gospel, I am the light of the world. But he also said that we are to be the lights of the world. And do you understand that men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil? And when they're living and practicing in the dark, and your life shines the light of truth upon it, the world will not enjoy their sins being illuminated. And it can be illuminated by the walk and the witness of our life. Proverbs 29, 27 says, An unjust man is abominable to the righteous. Look at this. And he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. Picture in your mind the worst, most godless, wicked sin you could imagine, perpetrated against the most innocent victim you could imagine, and think about how that turns your stomach. And everything in you says this ought not be. There ought to be a law against that. They ought to go to jail. They ought to suffer for what they've done. The Bible uses the same word to describe the way that the wicked look at the acts of the righteous. That when you do what's right, when you stand for what's godly, when you live out the truth of the Scripture, the lost world looks and says, that ought not be allowed. Something ought to be done about that. And that's the way that even the secular court system of America is moving. Meanwhile, the writer to the Hebrews said, we are to live as strangers and foreigners on the earth. 1 Peter 2.9 says, we are to be a peculiar people. Some of you got that one down. You're real peculiar. Second <laughs> uh, Corinthians 6:17 says, "We're to come out from among them and be 
separate. Yet for many believers, if we're really honest, the last thing we want to be is different from the world. We don't want to be different. We don't want our kids to have to be different. If everybody else at school has it, we want to get it for our child. We don't want them to be left out. If Hollywood says that's the latest movie, we all think we got to go see it like, like a bunch of cows with, with rings in our noses. If, if New York says that this is the latest fashion, then, then we think that we've got to buy it for our kids, even though it's made out of the same amount of material as a cotton ball in the top of a Tylenol bottle. It's prom weekend, I'm sorry. Your life can be a source of persecution, the witness from our life. But we see something else in this text. There's an indication that persecution comes because of the word on our lips. Twice in the text, Jesus talks about things that are being said when men revile you and say all manner of evil against you. Why are they saying evil things? It's because of the good things that we have said. No less than our Lord made this statement of his own preaching ministry. In John 15, 22, Jesus said, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have had no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Now to be clear, Jesus did not say, Mankind was sinless before I came. What he said was, the words that I spoke and the standard of righteousness that I was preaching was shining the light of truth on the darkness of their sin. And it was what Jesus said that tended to get Jesus in trouble. Things like, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I and the Father are one. And they really didn't like it when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And friend, I want you to pay close attention to a simple but irrefutable fact. It makes no sense that a world that hated Jesus so much for what he said, that they pushed him up a bloody pathway to a skull-shaped mountain where they nailed him to a cruel Roman cross, where they mocked him and scoffed at him and ridiculed, despised, and rejected him. It makes no sense that that same world system would lift us up and applaud us and throw us a ticker tape parade if we believe what he taught, embrace how he lived, and repeat what he said. When the apostles were in trouble before the Sanhedrin, the Bible says in Acts 4.18, they were warned and commanded not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. And beloved, that's the day we live in in many corners even of the American culture. Listen to me now. Believe what you want to believe. Think what you want to think. Just keep your mouth shut. Did you know in the United States people have been fired from their jobs for religious things they put on their private Facebook pages? You cannot believe that and publicly propagate it and work for our company. That's the United States of America today. And persecution comes when we faithfully represent Jesus. When Jim Baker was the Secretary of State, I don't mean the fallen televangelist, I mean Jim Baker who was a statesman in the, in the Bush administration, the Reagan administration, when he was the Secretary of State, He would bring newly appointed ambassadors into his office where he had a large spinning globe. And he would spin that globe around and ask the ambassador, can you locate and identify the country you've just been appointed to represent? And oftentimes they'd start spinning that globe around looking for these obscure out-of-way countries that you don't know where they are and you can't spell them or pronounce them. And Baker would turn that globe back around to North America and place their fingers squarely on the United States and say, that's the country you've been appointed to represent. Now, you may have been appointed to represent that country in some obscure foreign land that may even be hostile to what we believe, but this is the country you've been called to represent. Look right here, Christian friend. We are strangers and pilgrims in a hostile foreign land, and we must represent the principles and precepts of the kingdom of God. 
And when we do that, the world is not going to like that. We can face persecution because of the witness from our life, the word on our lips, but thirdly, because of the worship of our Lord. In verse 11, Jesus said, when they persecute you and revile you for my sake. That really is where the rubber meets the road. When you start lifting up the Lord Jesus. The world doesn't mind you being religious. But when you start saying stuff like, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, the world is not going to like that. It's been several years ago. I was invited to be the chaplain of the day for the Georgia House of Representatives. I'd done this three or four different times, and in the past, I had taken one of these, you know, grab you by the throat prophetic messages telling them that they better clean up or God was going to get them. <laughs> well, that day I decided I'm just going to take a word of encouragement, and I mentioned three things that I was praying for the legislators. And they included things like, I'm praying that God would give you wisdom. I'm praying that God would give you a, a, a spirit of peace. And I'm praying that God would give you physical protection. You see, not long before I was there that day, there had been a shooting in a government building somewhere else in the country. And, and there, was, there was armed presence like I'd never seen before at, at the Georgia State Capitol. I was aware that that, that, was, that was a dangerous time. I prayed that God would give them wisdom and a, and a sense of peace and be able to work together and that God would protect them physically. And then I prayed. And a left-wing le legislator came up to me before I could get out of that hall. And she confronted me, pointing her finger in my face. I am offended. I thought to myself, if that offended you, you ought to come to Emmanuel sometime. I mean, that was the most benign thing. Most of what I said that day wouldn't even bother the ACLU. That was just what God had put on my heart that day, to just bring a word of encouragement. I started walking to my truck, and I thought, what in the world could have offended her? All I did was pray these simple things, prayed that she wouldn't get shot or hurt. And I said, and then, then I just prayed, Lord, I offer this prayer the only way I can, the only way I know how, in the name of Jesus. Ring-a-ding-a-ding-ding-ding. -ding -ding. I said, Jesus, who was crucified and buried and rose from the dead, that all who will repent and believe can be saved. I know. That's just, hey, that's how I pray because that's the only way you can pray. Praying any other way is like putting a, an envelope in the mailbox without a stamp on it. It may look good and sound good, but it's not going anywhere. And when you start mentioning Jesus, that's when the world gets hostile. Perhaps you're familiar with the coexist bumper sticker. In recent days, it's actually even been co-opted by the LGBTQIA plus movement. It represents these icons of the great religions of the world, and now it is overlaid with the rainbow flag. Do you see that T on the end of coexist? It is supposedly to represent the cross of Jesus. Could I say very simply before I move on, the world doesn't mind that cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus that's on equal size and footing with all the other isms of the world and embraces whatever perversion your heart, your mind, your body wants to embrace, the world is not bothered by that Jesus. But when you start saying there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find yourself a recipient of the persecution Jesus talks about in this text. And he said it's a blessing. There are the reasons for persecution. Let me breathe a word or two about the results of persecution. How does persecution come? Now, you better know how it's going to come so you know how to respond to it. We've got some baseball coaches and other coaches in our church family. And uh, you know, guys, that, that um, uh, sometimes you have to yell out to the players on the, on the defensive side of the ball, plays at second. Or the bases are loaded, we got two outs, easy out. Or you got you to shout out, hey, here's what you need to do in response. And part of the reason I preach this message today is to let you know that persecution is coming and you better be ready for it. 
You better decide today, not then, but now, how you're going to respond. Persecution will come against the people of God in many ways. Three years ago, I gave you a list of five. I want to share them with you again. First, you'll find yourself socially abused. That is, you can be bullied, made fun of for your belief in Christ. You may find that you're not invited to the party. You may find that while you're qualified, you didn't get the promotion, and you instinctively know why. You may not get invited to the prom. Students, you may not even get invited out on Friday night at all. But listen to the preacher this morning. There are some things worse than being by yourself on a Friday night with your righteous standards and convictions. And that is waking up on a Saturday morning with a life full of regret and a heart full of grief because you didn't want to be socially abused and outcast. And so you lowered your standards and you lowered your morals. As adults, we can face ridicule. Not getting a job, not getting a promotion. You may find yourself, listen, even from the religious community, ridiculed for the way that you raise your kids, ridiculed for how many kids you have. If you have more than 2.2, some people will make fun of you. I always felt sorry for that point two kid. How are we to respond? Later in this very chapter, Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, you don't have to be a great theologian to know that if you're going to bless and pray for people who despitefully use you, the only way you get there is when you get despitefully used. You say, do you really think that kind of thing is happening against the people of God? Well, Jesus said in John 16, 2, they will make you outcasts from the synagogues. If you don't go along with this culture, listen, friend, even the religious culture of the world, you will face persecution. May I just share with you from my own personal testimony? I have faced persecution because I don't believe all the woke mantra of the Me Too movement. And some of that persecution comes even from within the church at large. When you stand for that which is right and straight and plain according to the Word of God, you will find yourself socially abused. Secondly, you may find yourself verbally attacked. In this text, Jesus says that they will revile you. One translation says they will insult you. And verse 11, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. It may come in the form of name calling, a whisper campaign against you, your business, your job, your reputation, your integrity. It may come in the form of gossip, and these days, social media is one of the primary places that it occurs. It may be from people who give these little sub-tweets and these thinly veiled attacks on Facebook. Hey, if you can't say it to somebody's face, don't say it on your Facebook. You may be called a holy roller, ultra-fundamentalist, ultra-conservative, alt-right, mean-spirited, right-wing, homophobic, intolerant, and all of the rest. And you may find out the hard way that whoever said sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a bald-faced lie. Persecution can come in a lot of different ways. You may find yourself socially abused, verbally attacked, You might even find yourself physically assaulted, physically assaulted. During the days of Emperor Nero, Christians were literally fed to lions. They were dipped in wax and lit on fire to make gruesome luminaries for the emperor's outdoor parties throughout church history. Some have been beheaded and burned at the stake. Simon Peter's answer to this in 1 Peter 3.14 said, Even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. 
You say, preacher, do you think it's possible that people could be physically assaulted in the United States for their stand for righteousness? I absolutely do. I didn't come today to be political, but I want you to go back with me in your minds to the summer of 2020. I really don't like going back there because we were in the very midst of the COVID pandemic. But there was something else going on in this country. There were riots across this country burning major American cities to the ground. Government buildings were being attacked. Businesses were being burned. Stores were being looted. And quite a few evangelical leaders, including quite a few Southern Baptist leaders, said before we criticize the anarchy, we need to lament and stop and listen and learn what's making them act that way. May I make a couple of observations? I hope so because it's my sermon. I don't need to stop, look, and listen to find out why depraved people act like depraved people. Depraved sinners act like depraved sinners because they're depraved sinners. The reason they perform deeds of darkness is because men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. The second observation I will make is this, and you better pay close attention to it. You you, you had better rue the day that in the United States of America it becomes acceptable to hurt someone, beat someone, burn their house to the ground, loot their business, and steal from them because you perceive something about that you don't like. That's already happening in the United States. And if you think that Christians are going to be left out of the melees, you don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. Jesus actually said in John 16, 2, an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he's offering a service to God. Now, certainly much of that happened in the first centuries of Christendom. But may I remind you, more Christians have been killed for their faith around the world in the 20th century than in the first 19 centuries of the church combined, physically assaulted. Fourthly, you may find yourself legally accused. You don't have to own a bakery to find yourself in legal trouble for standing for that which is right. I was raised in the height of the Cold War. I'm grateful my kids don't know anything about all the hostility between the United States and the former Soviet Union. We've got other obstacles today, but not that one. And one summer when I went to student camp, our guest speaker that night talked about uh, the uh, potential imminence of nuclear war. Well, that'll bless a bunch of middle schoolers. And he asked us, what do you think you would do if our country was overtaken tonight and a Russian soldier came in with with an assault rifle and said, deny Christ or I'm going to kill you. Are you ready to stand for Christ? And with all of the emotional manipulation that a youth service can sometimes have, people shot to their feet like covey of quail. And I thought, you don't even stand for Jesus instead of being shot? You don't even come back to church on Sunday night if the Braves go into extra innings. Where'd y'all go? (laughs) Be shot instead of standing for Christ. You're going to be like Paul and Silas and sing the gospel in prison. You don't even sing the gospel in church when everybody else is singing. But that doesn't mean that we cannot even in our day find ourselves legally accused. In Luke 21, 12, speaking of the second coming, Jesus said, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. There's our word again. How's that going to come? Delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. When I was serving as the chairman of the board for our national denomination, I was on a conference call with some missionaries from around the world. Uh, Some of them were serving in very dark and dangerous places. They 
It could not even be known that they were there as gospel missionaries. They had other jobs that gained them entrance into that country. One man who ministered in one of these uh, dark countries said that in their country, in order to be the pastor of one of the underground churches, to be the pastor of an illegal underground Christian church, you had to have an arrest record. Think about that. If our pulpit were vacant and we had a pulpit committee in this church, think about the stuff we'd want to see from our candidates. We'd want a resume, a list of some references we could call. We'd probably want them to text or email us a link to some of their recent sermons so that we can watch them and listen to them preach. We'd want a doctrinal statement from them, and all of those things are well and good. But in that country, they also wanted a copy of your most recent mug shot. If you think about it, it makes sense. In a country where it's illegal to be a Christian, if you're mature enough, vocal enough, firm enough to be our pastor, you ought to have gotten in some trouble for it already. And that day may well come to the United States of America. You may live long enough that we have to decide as a church, are we going to stand for this book or are we going to keep our tax-exempt status with the federal government? Quite frankly, I'll personally pay for the stamp to send that certificate back in. You may find yourself legally accused. Number five, we may find ourselves financially affected. Some of you, because of the business that you're in, you may find yourself to get that contract, to get that job, to work where you work, you've got to sign away your convictions. By the way, if you can sign away your convictions, I'm not trying to be unkind, they weren't really ever convictions to start with, they were hunches. Because a conviction is something you'd be willing to stand for. To get that job or to keep that job, you've got to go to diversity, equity, and inclusion training. You've got to go to sensitivity training. Now, Christian friend, I'm not opposed to any of those words. Those are not bad words according to the dictionary, but according to the culture, let me tell you what that means. You've got to say you're willing to embrace perversion of the weirdest and most sinful order. You may find that persecution, when it comes full force to Christians in America, it may hit you in your bank account before it hits you in the nose. Have you already decided how you're going to respond? Jesus said that we should rejoice and be exceedingly glad and consider it a blessing. The reasons for persecution, the results of persecution... I said all that to say this, I, got, I want to talk to you about the rewards from persecution. This is really my sermon this morning. I hope you haven't been timing me yet. This gets down to the idea, answering the question, how is persecution a blessing? Look at verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. I want you to look right here, listen to your pastor. I want to share my heart with you for a moment. If you've lived for Jesus and stood for Christ at any level in this culture, you know what it's like to face persecution and ridicule. I don't know that in the moment of persecution that I have ever, in that moment, rejoiced and been exceeding glad. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good at all. But I'm reminded that nothing about following Jesus is ever to be based on our feelings to begin with. We are commanded to rejoice and be exceeding glad. And I believe that we can do that if we'll understand better how it is that persecution leads to the blessing. Twice in verse 12, my Bible uses the word for, F-O-R. That's a purpose word. That's That's an explanation word. Why should I rejoice and be exceeding glad? For 
Great is your reward in heaven. For even so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. Now I want to share with you just from my own life and testimony real quickly three rewards that come from rightly facing persecution. Number one, you will experience supernatural power. When God allows persecution, hardship, and slander to put you in a place where you are totally indefensible, and you realize there ain't, listen to me now, there ain't a blessed thing you can do about it, that's when you will find yourself on your face plugging into a power from another world. This is what Paul experienced when he faced his thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was, but it may well have been a demon or a demonically motivated person. And he prayed for God to get him out of that difficulty. And no less than Jesus said to him, I'm not going to take the thorn away, but I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you my grace that will be sufficient for your need. And you're going to find out in that moment that my strength, Jesus' strength, is perfected, not in times of our strength, not in times of our ability, but he said, my strength is perfected in your weakness. And I am convinced that when we do not rejoice, listen, friend, when I don't rejoice in persecution, it's because in that moment I really don't see God as clearly as I need to see Him. Writing to first century Christians in 1 Peter 4, Simon Peter said, Therefore those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful Creator in doing what is right. To say, God, I trust you. Through the ridicule, the hardship, the slander, whatever it may be, I trust you. Why? Because you are a faithful Creator. And in those moments where you find yourself in the crucible of adversity, it's in that moment, if, 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 if you're worried, if you're, if you're fretting and fearful, in that moment you have forgotten how faithful your Creator really is. I recently, in a different sermon, told you about how when I was six years old, I was burned over a large portion of my upper body. For most of my elementary and into middle school years, I had surgery after surgery after surgery. I distinctly remember as a first grader when this injury first occurred, in my child's mind, I was very angry with my dad. I didn't understand how he could let them do this to me. Put me down in a hot tub of water for these hot baths. How he could let them pour this stuff at the hospital out of this bottle all across and over my burns. It, it already hurt bad enough. That made it sting worse. I begged him to not let them take me into surgery again. My daddy didn't listen to a single one of my requests. But you do understand that my anger toward him was not his fault. It was a flaw on my end. I didn't know my daddy as good as I needed to know him. And by God's grace would come to know him. I look back now and know that what I was mad at my daddy for allowing, he was actually being the best friend I had in the world. And when I wrestle with difficulty that God has allowed into my life, what I need to do is get a better glimpse of my Lord. Because the more I come to know Him, the closer I walk with Him, the better I come to understand Him. I can say with singer-songwriter Andre Crouch that I've had many tears and sorrows and questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. And when we respond rightly, you'll find there's a supernatural power. Quickly, you'll be blessed. Secondly, by personal purity. You see, fiery trials, even trials of persecution, have a way of sanctifying us and making us 
more like Jesus. Like the silversmith who puts that precious metal into the pot and cooks it and cooks it and cooks it until all of the impurities and the dross come to the top and he skims it off to purify it. God allows the fiery trials of this life to purify us. You see, friend, just like pressure on a water line, persecution can reveal things that you didn't know about you. You may find yourself responding with words that you didn't even know you knew. You may find yourself responding with a bite that you didn't think you were capable of. When somebody reviles and persecutes you, you may find yourself responding with an anger that two minutes earlier you would have sworn wasn't even down in your heart. But God has allowed that difficulty to bring it up to the surface. When it comes to slander and being reviled, listen, friend, sometimes your critics will tell you stuff that your friends won't. And it is a point of personal purification to get to a place of prayer and say, God, can any of it be true? And even when it's not, that is a point of personal growth and sanctification. As one hymn writer put it, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume, and thy gold to refine. Supernatural power of personal purity. Persecution can also result in an eternal perspective. Verse 12 again, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward. And I prompt, listen, I don't like these next two words. Great is your reward in heaven. You know what I wish it said? For great is your reward when I vindicate you by lunch tomorrow. For great is your reward when I make all of your accusers your footstool. For great is your reward when the person that didn't offer you the promotion gets fired and you end up running the whole place. But that's not what it says. Because when Jesus says your reward is going to be great in heaven, listen, that's not only a where word, it's a when word. That it's all going to be made right there, which sometimes means it's never going to be made right until then. For great is your reward in heaven. What could that reward possibly be? If you think about the reward you will get in heaven to hear your Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. I watched you, and I watched you endure. I watched you try to do what's right. Well done. And for the child of God, even facing persecution, There will never be a greater blessing than that. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emanuel Pulpit.